Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, tonight for this evening's author talk. I'm Terry Freeman. I am the executive director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's um, program. Uh, this evening, we are going to talk with Dr. Marcia Chatlain. Uh, Dr. Chatlain is a professor of history and African American studies at Georgetown University. She is the author of South Side Girls, Growing Up in the Great Migration. Um, and she is a scholar of African American life and culture. Her most recent book is Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. She's a frequent public speaker and consultant to educational institutions, and she delivers lectures and workshops on inclusive teaching, social movements, and food justice. So all of us, I'm sure, are very familiar with McDonald's, so this should be a very interesting conversation. So I introduce to you now, Dr. Marcia Chatling. Thank you. thank you so much for the warm welcome, and thank you for everyone out in the audience for joining for this virtual uh, book talk. I am incredibly um, moved each and every time I have the opportunity to talk about my work Considering the book came out in January of uh, 2020, it had a short life on the road. And so I'm so glad that I've been able to continue the conversations excuse me, about franchise. So at this time, I'm going to share my presentation and I'm gonna walk you through the inspiration as well as some of the content in the book. And then we'll open it up for questions and reflections um, from the audience to uh, engage on this topic. When you write a book about McDonald's, the best thing about that is that most, if not all people in the audience have some experience of the Golden Arches. Uh, only two times in my experience uh, touring this book have I had the experience of someone having never been to McDonald's or never eaten at a McDonald's. So if you are in that position, uh, I'd love to hear from you in the Q&A portion. So, when I started thinking about writing a book that addresses some of the pressing questions that we ask today about the nature of food and nutrition and health and race, I wanted to use history as a guidepost for understanding our contemporary conversations about fast food. And one of the people that led me down the rabbit hole to learn more about fast food in Black America is this guy. In case you can't um, identify him, he is Bill Clinton. He was the president of the United States in the 1990s. And if you remember the 1992 presidential election, Bill Clinton was often spotted um, jogging sometimes with his vice president, Al Gore, and stopping by McDonald's. And scenes like this were often used to kind of make fun of candidate Clinton as well as President Clinton. If you were um, a watcher of Saturday Night Live in the 90s, you may remember that the late comedian Phil Hartman used to give um, a pretty good Bill Clinton impression. And it would show Bill Clinton going into McDonald's, eating French fries off of his constituents' trays and talking about his various policy ideas. But one of the reasons why I'm particularly curious about Bill Clinton and fast food is because of something written by the writer Toni Morrison. You may remember that people often mention that Toni Morrison had called Bill Clinton the first black president. And this was a quote that was brought up multiple times when the real first black president, Barack Obama, ran for office. And so a lot of people quote Morrison's um, comment about Clinton being the black, first black president, but very few people have actually read the essay, which was from the New Yorker's Talk of the Town segment. And so we're gonna look at a quote from this essay that opens up a lot of the conversation for my book. So when Toni Morrison called Bill Clinton the first black president, what she was referring to was the way that Congress was relentlessly pursuing Bill Clinton during the impeachment trials. And she was suggesting that the ways that Congress pursued him were similar to the ways that black people cannot get justice in our criminal justice system. And she wrote, after all, Clinton displays almost every trope of blackness, single parent household, born poor, working class, 
saxophone playing, McDonald's and junk food loving boy from Arkansas. One of the things that I found really fascinating about this essay and other ways that we think about McDonald's, particularly as it relates to Bill Clinton, is that McDonald's is eaten by people all over the world and in different places. But there's something about McDonald's that is read as black. And so I was curious about what were the origins of McDonald's presence in Black America? How did a brand that was fundamentally associated with white flight suburbs and bedroom communities become such a presence and such a fixture in Black communities? And how could I better understand the fact that my first engagement with serious history on the Great Migration, the topic of my first book, was through a contest that had been partially sponsored by the Chicago chapter of the National Black McDonald's Operators Association. What was that relationship between Black, and Amer Black America and McDonald's? What did it mean for our understanding, not just of food and health and nutrition, but politics, economics, and civil rights? So when you start thinking about writing a book about McDonald's, you see McDonald's everywhere. This is the scene from a McDonald's on Florissant Avenue in Ferguson, Missouri shortly after the uprising following the killing of Michael Brown by Officer Darren Wilson. If you read some of the coverage of those incredibly tense and difficult nights in Ferguson, you saw that people referred to this McDonald's location, which was one of the few businesses that was able to remain open during the unrest. This McDonald's was a meeting place for all of the actors in the drama of Ferguson. You saw state troopers and police officers using the McDonald's parking lot for shift changes. Journalists would use the free Wi-Fi in this McDonald's to upload their stories to servers. Um, journalist Wesley Lowry was actually arrested at this McDonald's for trespassing. One night, protesters stormed this McDonald's looking for milk to relieve the sting of the tear gas that had been deployed in the night sky. And this was a place where local people also gathered to watch television and watch the coverage of Ferguson, Missouri. And so this image of McDonald's at the center of a moment of racial unrest made me think of this moment. This is Washington, D.C. in 1968, one of the cities that exploded after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Washington, D.C., Chicago, Baltimore, and other cities were the site of the kind of confrontations between everyday people and police that really um, marked the ways that the racial unrest of the 1960s would often bubble up and explode um, in the spring and summer times. Now, there is a direct relationship between this moment in 2000, ooh, pardon, 2014 and this moment in 1968. And that is where my book franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, begins. So before we dive in, I just want to give you a little information on what is a franchise. Some of you out in the audience may be investors in or owners of your own franchise. But one of the things that we often associate franchising with is the fast food industry. But a lot of businesses operate with the franchise model. And when we think about a franchise, I liken it in the book to a relationship between a parent and a child. And it's like if there was a household where the parent makes all the rules, but the children make all the money. A franchise is any business that provides um, individual operators um, a license and a blueprint to operate a branch of that business. So if you've stayed at a Hampton Inn, that is part of Hilton Hotels worldwide. You may have been in a franchise. If you have gone through a drive through in McDonald's, you are likely to have patronized a franchise. If you've ever been to a Sports Clips, a Supercuts, um, a number of businesses. Uh, there are about 760,000 businesses in the United States that use this franchise model, and about a quarter million of them are fast food restaurants. So, I'm going to walk you through the various issues that I raised in the book, and I hope this uh, stimulates some good questions and um, some remarks from the audience. So the first chapter of the book is called Fast Food Civil Rights, and it's a retelling of the origin story of McDonald's. If you are interested in business history or had the opportunity to see that movie starring Michael Keaton about Ray Kroc called The Founder, who started the franchise system for McDonald's, you're familiar with a lot of stories about McDonald's. Its founders, uh, Richard and Maurice McDonald, two brothers from New Hampshire who go out to California, 
who fail at a series of businesses until they strike gold with McDonald's. And part of why McDonald's was so popular was because they were able to reduce the menu. So this uh, slide shows one of the original menus of McDonald's where they were doing a lot of stuff, peanut butter and jelly and barbecue and tamales. But this menu was later um, cut down to burgers, french fries and drinks. And what they discovered was by reducing the menu, reducing um, customization in their product, uh, getting rid of silverware and using paper products to wrap the food and getting rid of car hops, that they were able to serve more people, lower prices and make a fortune. And so that is the dominant narrative about the miracle of McDonald's. But one of the things that I was interested in was to tell the racial story of McDonald's, the ways that racial exclusion allowed for the fast food industry to grow. If you think about the growth of all white suburbs that were catered to by um, fast food restaurants like McDonald's, the rise of car culture, cars being made in Detroit, where the racial discrimination of workers was rampant and cars became inaccessible because of their prices to black consumers. The rise of car culture is also about racial exclusion. If you think about the highway system that was responsible for destroying so many black communities, as well as the ways that neighborhoods were displaced under slum clearance in order to create communities that were more livable and viable for white residents, you see another example of the ways that McDonald's growth is also about the suppression of Black opportunity. And so after I tell that story, thinking about the racial roots of McDonald's, I talk about the fact that McDonald's was the site of a lot of anti-segregation protests by major civil rights organizations. One of the things I found curious is that when we look at the iconic history of the sit-in movements uh, in the Deep South among college students, as well as the desegregation of public accommodations, we often think of brands that are no longer with us, like Katz's Drugs and Woolworth's Counters. But McDonald's was also part of that narrative. And I talk about the ways that the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as well as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had targeted campaigns against McDonald's restaurants in Arkansas, Tennessee, as well as North Carolina, because they practiced segregation. And so I found it curious that McDonald's has been conveniently written out of this history of protest. And one of the things that I find is that McDonald's writes itself into the history of America's racial struggles after 1968. And that's where chapter two comes in, Burgers in the Age of Black Capitalism. And this chapter captures the moment in which McDonald's makes a decision to allow some of its white franchise owners who were doing business in black neighborhoods or communities that had become black because of residential white flight had given them the opportunity to leave those stores in exchange for stores in white communities and in their place became a group of black franchise owners who were the eventual founders of the National Black McDonald's Operators Association. This handful of men were the first to introduce McDonald's into predominantly black communities, and they soon uh, proved to McDonald's that they were quite successful in capturing the black consumer market. This is a plaque from a McDonald's restaurant in Woodlawn, a neighborhood in Chicago. And it is no coincidence that this McDonald's restaurant, which had formerly been um, operated by a white franchise owner, uh, became the property of a black franchise owner eight months after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. I tell the story of um, a man named uh, Roland Jones, who was essentially dispatched to try to find black uh, business people, entrepreneurs, people from different communities who are trusted, who could go in and become the franchisees of McDonald's. And in my research, um, I looked at a lot of uh, Black newspapers like the Chicago Defender, uh, the Baltimore Afro-American, and I found often these articles about these franchise owners. They were considered incredibly important members of the community, not only because they were um, among a small group of Black business owners, but they were also incredibly generous in their philanthropy and their ability to organize different efforts on behalf of the community. So in this picture, in the center is Herman Petty, who's credited as the first black franchise owner. And he's flanked by uh, Leonard Bennett and a man named Willie Wilson, who is still very active in the Chicago community. He runs for president, I think like every four years. 
So as the story unfolds about McDonald's introducing itself to Black America, I look at the relationship between McDonald's and politics in chapter three, the burger boycott and the ballot box, which captures the tense re-election uh, bid for um, Carl Stokes, who was considered the first Black ma mayor of a major city. He was elected uh, to mayor of Cleveland in a special election. And during his re-election campaign, he found himself in the middle of a boycott of McDonald's in Cleveland. And this boycott was different than the boycotts that are associated with the civil rights struggle. This boycott wasn't about public accommodations. In fact, these McDonald's locations on the east side of Cleveland were serving a lot of black customers. The issue at hand was that black community members believed that if a restaurant was going to make so much money from black people, it should be franchised by a black person. And so an umbrella group formed called Operation Black Unity. And this is one of the groups that was part of that um, configuration called Afroset. And they organized a series of boycotts of McDonald's in the summer of 1972, while Carl Stokes is trying to become the re-elected mayor of Cleveland. And it complicates his campaign because he's trying to make the point that he could be the mayor of all people in Cleveland, black and white. And at the center of this is a black political group that is associated with a more radical element in the community that is challenging McDonald's presence in black communities and effectively boycotting and creating financial strain on those locations. I like this anecdote um, to tell a story about a time in which McDonald's was not everywhere and the real mixed feelings that Black people had about this major corporation moving into their neighborhood. When we listen to public health practitioners and people who are concerned about food and nutrition, they often um, act as if there's some like special relationship between Black people and McDonald's. And one of the things that I, I, I tried to do with franchise is to historicize this relationship to help people understand that in this critical moment after 1968, when so many businesses are not only destroyed in uprisings, but so many um, white business owners actually participate in economic white flight and close businesses and take jobs away, and new businesses are not opening, McDonald's was really a welcome presence in some places, but it was challenged on its racial politics. And if McDonald's was going to claim that being present in a black community was doing something for the community, then community members wanted to be able to hold McDonald's to certain expectations. And I continue along these lines in thinking about um, communities and accountability and scrutiny of McDonald's. In chapter four, Bending the Golden Arches, the photograph you see in front of you is a picture from a police surveillance of a protest of a McDonald's in the Albina neighborhood in uh, Portland, Oregon. And this McDonald's was a target of protest because the local McDonald's franchise owner refused to participate in the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense free breakfast program for children. And this tension between McDonald's and the Black Panthers included an allegation that the Black Panthers were behind a bombing of that McDonald's. And as the community continued to scrutinize McDonald's and its refusal to participate in the food program, as well as its use by police to um, surveil people and transfer suspects of crimes, the backlash against McDonald's um, opened up a series of conversations 